I know I say this every other video, if not every video, but I'm gonna keep saying it probably until the end of time. I promise you, my output of video content will increase. Swearsies. And I apologize, because I know I missed a golden opportunity to hit you with a lot of like Halloween-themed related videos last month, but real life set in and you gotta focus on the job and the personal life and be in the right mindset to be able to even think about tackling some content on this site. So YouTube had to take something of a back seat for most of October, and I promise I'm gonna try my best to make it up to y'all here in November. And you're probably wondering, well, gee, Mike, what could possibly follow up Halloween? Well, how about looking back and chronicling the efforts of a particular actor and performer who, despite having an extensive resume of films under his belt, seems to only get marginalized to two big roles. That's right, we're gonna focus on Mr. Harrison Ford in what I'm calling Ford's Giving. <laughs> oh, bad title, but whatever, I'm lazy, I'm going with it. So here in the month of Ford's Giving, I'm gonna be doing a couple of videos here and there that kind of showcase some of maybe the lesser known or underappreciated efforts of Mr. Harrison Ford. Ranging from this guilty pleasure treasure right here to maybe a video essay about one of his other films to maybe a character select episode showcasing one of his iconic roles. And you're probably wondering why Harrison Ford of all people. Well, Harrison Ford's presence in film certainly was a big influence on me growing up, as I'm sure it was for a lot of you. Very much in the early days of my youth, I was fully aware of who Han Solo and Indiana Jones were, and their distinct personalities and his distinct approach to those characters certainly kind of set the tone for what I wanted to get out of my action leads in certain films. But as I grew up, I began to appreciate the range Mr. Ford actually has, with regards to going for a really emotional, deep, you know, methodical type of acting, to when he can be a little bit lighter, a little bit funnier even. And say what you will about contemporary Harrison Ford, but I love whenever I see this guy doing the public circuit. I know a lot of people might be put off by the way he's so awkward on talk shows and interviews and how he's kind of playing up that image of being another one of Hollywood's grumpy old granddads now, but I feel that's really all intentional. I think he's purposely trolling all of us and just playing this aloof, bumbling dude who's very terse, a man of few words, if you will, and who can stare you down into intimidation. It would be really stupid to be crazy and a helicopter pilot. You don't need to do both. <laughs> okay, yeah. I see where you're going with this. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, we're good. Yeah, we're good. I feel he's kind of earned that because if I had to put up with 40 plus years about people just asking me the same questions about Star Wars or Indiana Jones, I'd probably put up that front pretty quick. Movie looks good. Movie is good. All right, so. So let's get into this Ford's giving with a guilty pleasure treasure of mine that honestly I still enjoy to this day quite a bit. The rarely ever talked about, and I feel horribly underappreciated, 1988 film, Frantic. Do you know where you are? No. The thing that first drew me into this viewing experience was the combination of actor and director. Never in my wildest dreams did I think Harrison Ford and Roman Polanski, of all people, would be collaborating on a movie. But then after I got into it, I really, really enjoy this film for a lot of different things. To give you sort of a basic summary, Frantic is about the story of Dr. Richard Walker, a very successful surgeon who has a very beautiful wife and something happens to the wife that sends the good doctor sort of on a bit of a back and forth, a chase, if you will, at times, almost as if he's some kind of fugitive. I have witnesses. My wife was kidnapped. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes, yes, of course. But what would you like us to do exactly? Yeah, this kind of rings familiar from the log line, essentially, but believe me, there are distinct differences between this and The Fugitive. 
The least of which is that this predates The Fugitive by about five years. But in all seriousness, the plot is more of a Hitchcockian type of mystery thriller than it is action-based, which is very much Polanski's wheelhouse. He's all about mysteries and suspense-driven stories, and more about setting up atmosphere for the characters to walk uneasily through. So very early on in the film, Richard's wife ends up missing as they are in a trip to Paris and having the most passive-aggressive dialogue back and forth. Nice view. It's magnificent. It should look exceptionally lovely from the Eiffel Tower this afternoon where you and Dr. Allen Bear can share it together. Oh. Honey, I'm not gonna go. Don't confirm the lunch. Why not? You did tell Morris Allenberry that you were arriving a day early, didn't Honey. you? Oh, Richard, you obviously want to see him. Now, come on, just give me the note. Richard, don't mess I didn't up. tell him when I was coming. Richard, oh. give me the note. Give me the... Richard, give me the... And the MacGuffin of the entire plot revolves around this idea that they picked up the wrong suitcase at the airport. So Harrison Ford actually has a suitcase that belongs to someone else, and within that suitcase are clues leading towards a deeper mystery, and also determining what happened to his wife. And along the way, he meets up with the young and vivacious and beautiful Michelle, played by Emmanuel Sangier. Look for me here. What did you get, Zad? In your suitcase. So you have it. Don't pay me what you owe me. I did my job. Job? That's right. You know what I mean. Future Mrs. Polanski for all the laymen out there. You might also know her as the silent badass in The Ninth Gate with Johnny Depp. But this is her debut film role, and she ends up getting involved in this mystery with Richard Walker as they attempt to figure out, like, who has his wife, what they want. You know, there are other parties, like, after her, they end up killing one of her acquaintances. They end up traveling to the seedy underbelly of Paris, where you got people just picking up dudes at the bar and making them snort coke out of their coke fingernail in the restroom. Come now, man, the nose knows. The white lady. You've got great character actors at work here, such as John Mahoney as a member of the U.S. Embassy. I want you to find my wife. Uh, you understand, Dr. Walker, ours is basically a liaison function. Uh, we can assist you in communicating with the French police. We can put a little pressure on the Ministry of Interior, but this is their country. And there's even a cameo from the Big Lebowski himself. Is there a doctor in the house? Dickie! Uh, Peter, <laughs> mix up with the bags. Mix up with the bags. Mm -hmm. One thing that could serve as a detriment to the viewing for some people might be sometimes the tone of certain characters as the story progresses. This isn't necessarily an issue for me because it's something I just notice about Polanski films from time to time ever since Japanese Satanist and Rosemary's Baby. Oftentimes, especially in these mystery narratives that he concocts, a lot of the supporting players or background players seem a little too, let's say, on the nose with being duplicitous, even if they aren't necessarily duplicitous or traitorous in any way. Case in point, when Richard's wife goes missing initially and he starts putting out feelers there to see like, well, what could have happened to her? Everyone from the hotel staff to the police force seem to constantly be purposefully shifting him off course. But not because they have anything to do with the actual mystery, but just because that's in their nature to shift him off course, apparently. It doesn't seem to be very much to go on to support your kidnapping theory. This is your only evidence. Dr. You know what Walker. it means to me? He had his arm around her? Here, like this. He could have had a gun. Yes, yes, it could mean that. Or they could have just been having a good time. Mr. Schaff, you're talking about my wife. You must be thinking about yours. For example, this hotel security guy kind of implies like, well, does she have a lover here in Paris? Is it possible she met someone then? Someone she has been thinking about? Since June 15, 1968? Please, don't take offense. I'm an ex-cop. <laughs> you don't know. I am French. It is my purpose in this story to undermine your investigation. Terrible French accent. <laughs> you took five years of French, Mike. What the hell? 
Also, getting back to the Big Lebowski's cameo, he's there for a convention to be a special speaker at this surgeon's conference, and he just so happens to bump into all of his doctor and surgeon friends everywhere, from the airport where he's trying to find the bag with Mich the, the suitcase with Michelle, and everyone gives Michelle this look of like, oh my goodness, she's wearing a leather jacket with shoulder pads. What a whore. How's your wife, Richard? Like, everyone's just giving him that kind of side eye all the time. And he runs into these people constantly, going from the airport to this nightclub, which is exclusive and private, and they're all, they all just happen to be there. It's just sort of a tone that I see set up in a lot of Polanski movies. It's not exclusive to this one. I saw it set up certainly in Rosemary's Baby and that's very on the nose in that movie. It's not a deal breaker for me with regards to this movie because the story is genuinely intriguing and the acting is top notch. Harrison Ford is really putting in a lot of dramatic effort here. It feels like he he's a character meant for a more Hitchcockian experience, which I feel Polanski is definitely going for with Frantic. There's, there's a certain emotional apex in the movie where he does have a mini breakdown about the situation and he has to call his kids up on the phone who are still in the States and talk to them as if everything's normal. And I believe that this is a man torn. But then he can improvise and get wild and crazy and then we have images like this. Crazy America. Goddamn right there may be some mistake. Cool it, cool it, just cool it, mister. We're only asking the young lady a few questions. You're not asking her jack shit, man. Go on, get out of here. Haul ass I haven't hey, got all day. Buck naked Harrison Ford with his twig and berries protected by a teddy bear. You're welcome, folks. And he's certainly more of what I like to call a Looney Tunes-ish version of Dr. Richard Kimball from The Fugitive. I love The Fugitive, don't get me wrong, but Richard Kimball is certainly on top of stuff 100%. He knows exactly what to do, he's very resourceful, and he knows exactly which action will give him the best positive result. Dr. Richard Walker, he fumbles a lot. My personal favorite comedic and suspense sequence all at once is when he's walking across a rooftop. He is stumbling and slipping because his shoes aren't meant to be scaling rooftops on with this suitcase full of stuff, full of the MacGuffin that we're looking for throughout this whole movie. And he gets it caught on a windowsill or something and tries to just yank it off and it just opens up and everything comes flying out of the suitcase and he just has this defeated look of, this is all I needed now. Thanks, nature. I love that about his performance here. It is very human. It's very down to earth and relatable. But not to just make this movie the Harrison Ford show because everyone else does a really great job as well. Emmanuel Sonye for a debut in this movie is actually really likable. I really get a lot out of her performance here. She can be funny, she can be opportunistic, but you get a sense too that she can be very sweet and kind hearted as well. I do like the character of Michelle quite a bit. She's a great partner with Walker throughout this whole escapade. And it doesn't go the romantic tension route with those two, which I'm thankful for because that's not necessary in a movie like this. Certainly in a trashier or less sophisticated movie, that would probably be front and center right there. But this is about a guy who's trying to get the wife he loves back. And Michelle can be both an advantage and a detriment to that mission at times. And it leads to, honestly, for me, a very heartbreaking ending. <laughs> Ultimately, it's a very satisfying mystery plot. And the reveal of what everyone's searching for, or what everyone's after, what everyone hopes to gain, isn't a letdown necessarily. And given the time period, it makes a lot of sense. So without a doubt, I highly recommend Frantic. It is a well put together mystery thriller that is entertaining, has a good amount of suspense and pacing laced throughout it. It's two hours and it didn't feel like two hours to me. But if you're going in this looking for nonstop punching from Harrison Ford on bad guys and trying to fight a one-armed man or something like that, none of that's here to be found. This is the more cerebral fugitive, I guess. That concludes the first installment of Ford's Giving. Stay tuned, I will have more Harrison Ford related goodies coming soon this month. Fancy an awkward pause before you leave? Ha, 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 ha.